It's time to answer your questions about the bandsaw. Hi, I'm Kent and welcome to Turn a Wood Bull. Today we're going to cover many of the questions that you have for me regarding the bandsaw. And we're going to go over a lot of the basics about bandsaws. So stay tuned. First of all, I want to let you know that number one, I'm not sponsored by anybody. Now you're going to see my particular model and that's the model I happen to have. I really don't have the budget, the space or the time to be buying a variety of different bandsaws and testing them out. I know that the one I have works pretty well. Now, the one that I have also has a very specific feature and I'm gonna point that out to you later, so stay tuned for that. Also, just know that these models change all the time and the model that you see me using isn't even available anymore. I will put a link to a model that's very similar to the model that I use. For whatever reason, the manufacturers love to change their models on a regular basis. So it's hard to keep up with one particular model. So like I said, I'll put a link in the description below this video, so check that out. Also, while you're down there, click that like button if you're liking this video. Thank you. All right, we need to know the basics of how a bandsaw works. And really, it's not much different than all of our other power woodworking tools. There's an electric motor and it goes round and round and round. Yep, that's it. Except with a bandsaw, that electric motor is powering the lower wheel. In my case, it's the lower wheel on this bandsaw. And the blade itself is driven and goes around the top wheel and it spins. It goes around and around. It's really that simple. We need to keep in mind that the bandsaw's energy, its force, is a downward direction. So when we're at the bandsaw, we need to be always aware of that. Now, we need to think of this and compare it to other things. We can compare this to a table saw. A table saw's energy is coming out towards us, so we're always aware that we could get something that binds up and kicks out towards us. So we just need to remember that with the bandsaw, the energy is going downward, and that downward energy could cause issues when we don't have supported material. Now, what do I mean by supported material? Well, if we don't have a solid base on the piece that we're cutting or we're going to run through the bandsaw, if it's wobbling or tilting or it's just not supported, in this case, if I tried to make a bowl blank with the log with the bark side down, unsupported, so that that log essentially wobbles on the table of the bandsaw, well, guess what? When the force of that blade comes in contact with the wood, it's going to drive that side down instantly. Instead, what I want to do is I want to take that blank or that half of a log and put the flat side down. That's going to give me plenty of support to turn and cut the piece so that it's well supported all the way around. It's also with round logs. We don't ever want to put a round log into the bandsaw because the force and the energy initially, if there's any catches or if the blade doesn't cut smoothly immediately, which inevitably it always does, there's something that will catch a little bit, it's going to immediately twist and turn that log. If you do want to cut a log that is round like that, that doesn't have a solid base on it for support, then you're going to need to create a sled that will ride along in the guide rail for your bandsaw that can actually support that piece while it's moving through the blade. You don't ever want to do this by hand because that's a great way to twist the, the log and cause all kinds of damage to the blade and potentially yourself. Now, I'm not saying any of this to scare you. If you understand how the bandsaw works and you understand where you could potentially get in trouble, then you're gonna be less likely to actually get in trouble because you know what you're doing. So don't be afraid of the bandsaw. Understand what's going on. Now, one of the things that's super important is to read your manufacturer's instructions. Why? Well, a variety of reasons. You want to make sure that you have everything set up properly. You also want to look at the specific safety details for your bandsaw because every manufacturer does things a little bit differently. So they may have recommendations for you safely using your bandsaw a little bit different than some other manufacturers. So read those instructions. It's super important. Okay, let's talk about size. What's in a name? Well, if you look up any of these bandsaws, they like to put the size of the bandsaw 
in the name. This is a Grizzly 17 inch bandsaw. That may be a little bit misleading because your mind might start thinking, great, I can cut a 17 inch piece of wood. That's fantastic. Or you might think I can cut a 17 inch wide piece of wood. Well, that's not actually the case. When you're reading the size of the bandsaw, the size has to do with the width of the wheels on the bandsaw, not the clearance. So for instance, this particular bandsaw has 17 inch wheels and the height of which I can cut is actually 12 inches. I can also cut about 14 inches wide on that. So I can't cut 17 inches. I can't cut 17 inches wide or 17 inches high, but this is using 17 inch wheels. So keep in mind, if you're looking at a 10 inch bandsaw, the height that it can cut is probably six to seven inches and perhaps eight or nine inches wide. So keep that in mind. And that being said, it would be really difficult to turn a 12 inch tall solid piece of wood with this bandsaw. Now, this is more the size of what I typically like to turn, something about this, and this bandsaw works well. If you're gonna be taking logs and turning them into large bowl blanks like you see me do on this channel, then you're probably gonna want something like this bandsaw. But if you don't, and you're turning things that are smaller, maybe you wanna do some smaller projects, smaller bowls and dishes and things like that, then you could probably get away with the 10 inch bandsaw without too much trouble. Let's talk about power. All right, now I'm gonna be honest with you. You do not want to go low with this. You do not wanna be cheap with power. If you're looking at a model and there are a couple models available. Maybe there's one with a one horse motor or one and a half horse motor and a two or two and a half horse motor. You definitely want to go with the larger electric motor. Now, I know it's gonna cost a little bit more. If you can't afford it right now, then wait. Save your money, buy it later with the larger motor. You will thank me in the long run. And I don't want you to find out the hard way because if you get an underpowered bandsaw and you're trying to cut blanks like this, here's what's gonna happen. Number one, the blade is gonna bog down, probably bind up in the piece, which is a nightmare to get apart. And you'll probably trip your breaker frequently, especially if it's a 110 bandsaw. So don't do it, don't skimp out, try to get the most powerful bandsaw that you can afford. Now, keep in mind, if you're gonna be doing smaller things like this, you can do a smaller bandsaw motor as well. So if you look at the 10 inch bandsaws that are out there, and I'll put links to a couple of really good ones, and I'll put a link to the one that I had before as well. You can do some, some great stuff with pieces like this, but if you're doing larger pieces, you do not wanna be underpowered. Now, you might be thinking 220, 220 volt sounds intimidating if you don't have outlets perhaps in your shop, but it's not that complicated. I had an electrician come out in a short period of time for not a lot of money. They were able to put in outlets for me for both my lathe and my bandsaw. It's not as big of a deal as you think. So get a couple good quotes from electricians and if you don't have 220 in your shop and you'll be surprised how much of a difference it makes. The bandsaw I have has a two horsepower motor and it's 220 volt and it rarely bogs down. It takes a really wet piece of wood that restricts on the blade to make it want to hesitate. It is very powerful and just walks through big logs like this in no time. And I've got to tell you, I'm super happy that I went with the 220 volt and I went with the larger motor. So don't skimp out when it comes to power if you're looking to purchase a new bandsaw. All right, here is probably one of the biggest questions I get, the blade. What size blade do I use? Well, there's lots of measurements that go into measuring a bandsaw blade. Number one, there is the overall size. That size is gonna be specific for your, your machine. Mine is 131 and a half inches. That's the size of the loop. Every machine is gonna be different and you need to have that size exact to match your machine. So that's the overall size. Then we're gonna talk about the width. Now the blade I like to use to cut large bowl blanks and go through green wood 
is a half inch wide blade with three teeth per inch. That's about every two and a half centimeters. There are three teeth. This is considered a very coarse blade. This is kind of like roughing. When we're roughing out a bowl, we're just ripping out material to create that rough shape for the bowl. This is not a finishing blade. This is designed to cut through green wood that's potentially very wet and rip out the dust and clear out a path so that it gets cut. If you try cutting a large bowl blank of green wood using a traditional or fine tooth blade, you're gonna have all kinds of headaches because that blade is gonna be trying to remove all that wet material away and it's gonna get bogged down. Instead, the coarse three teeth per inch is just ripping and moving all of that material out very quickly so it gets through and makes the cut rather rapidly. So you do not wanna use a medium or fine blade when you're roughing out larger blanks like this. Now, something else that I've found is super important. Pay attention because you're not gonna wanna miss this. Of all of the things I've learned about saw blades, there is one thing that it makes all of the difference between a blade that's gonna give you all kinds of frustration and one that will work very well most of the time. That is the thickness of the blade. Yes, the thickness. For whatever reason, the material, if it's 0 0.035 inches thick or potentially a little bit thicker than that, they work great. If you get down to the 0 0.032 inch blades, I've had a lot of those snag, kink up, and bind up in wet green wood. Just a nightmare. You really don't want to go down that road. So listen again, 0 0.035 inches or thicker is super important. That's a heavy enough material that it seems to go through thick pieces of wood without getting caught up. I've tried the ones that are 0 0.30 and 0 0.32, and like I said, they bind up, they'll kink. Once a blade kinks, forget it, you're done. You gotta put a whole new blade on. So the 0 0.035 might cost a little bit more. I don't even know if it does. It's probably very similar in cost, but it's well worth it any extra cost because it's gonna save you in the long run. You're probably gonna have to do two or three blades by the time you need to replace the one that is 0 0.035 thick or thicker. So remember, if you've learned nothing else from this video, look for that thickness. There are not a lot of manufacturers making them and if I can find a link for that, I will put it down in the description below this video, so check that out. One other thing that you're gonna to wanna to know about the blade size is the width of the blade, in this case, my blade is half inch wide, is going to dictate how tight of a radius you can turn. Now, that's not so much of a big deal for the large bowls like this, but when you get down to smaller things like this, what you're really doing is you're nibbling away material. Probably not gonna make a perfectly smooth circle, which is fine. We just wanna get this close to round so that we can bring it to the lathe and then true it up when we're on the lathe. But just remember, the wider the blade, the larger that radius needs to be when you're turning. So you don't want to be turning super tight and bind up the blade on itself because of the thickness of the blade. So just remember, the wider the blade, the larger you're gonna to need to make that radius. The thinner the blade, it becomes more like a jigsaw and you can turn tight corners, but we don't really use really thin blades when we're cutting out, roughing out bowl blanks. I use the half inch, it works really well for me. So let's just recap. You get the blade to the length that fits your machine. That's a must. I use the half inch blade that has three teeth per inch, about two and a half centimeters, and it is 0 0.035 inches thick or thicker if you find one that's thicker. I probably wouldn't go too thick with it, but 0 0.035 seems to be the magic thickness that works really well for me. What's the general setup of the machine right before we're going to use it. Number one, we wanna follow all the instructions from the manufacturer, make sure everything is set up properly. We wanna make sure that the blade is in the guides properly. I can't tell you how many times I put a blade on the machine and for whatever reason, one point 
it is not in the tracks the way it should be. And the way you can tell this is with the power off and with the bandsaw unplugged from the wall, you can open up the doors and manually turn the wheel. If the wheel turns smoothly, you should be fine. If you're feeling any friction or any resistance anywhere, if you're hearing anything scratching, then you're gonna check and follow the path of the blade and see where it's binding up. It may not be in a guide just right, and you're gonna to wanna to make sure you've got that set up. Now, what maintenance is there with a bandsaw? Well, essentially we need to keep it clean. Now, there are various ports on the bandsaw where you can put in a vacuum system. I don't have that set up here. I manually just clean out the cabinets with the power off and everything. I will go through and clean out all the dust from the cabinets periodically and make sure everything is clear and running smoothly. Also, the one thing that you're really gonna to wanna to pay attention to is your blade. Your blade will obviously dull over time and you need to replace dull blades. It's kind of like understanding when to go back to the sharpening station when you're turning. If you're not paying attention, it's easy to use a tool that really needs to be sharpened. In this case, the blade needs to be taken off and a new, new blade needs to be put in its place. So pay attention, if you're forcing wood into the blade, not only is that dangerous, but it's also a good indication that the blade is dull. If that's the case, then switch out the blade and put on a new blade. The other thing that you need to check periodically, especially if you've been having issues adjusting your blade and getting it to ride on the wheels properly, you need to check the tires. Yes, there are tires on these wheels. When I first heard that, I thought, wait, what? You're calling the wheel a tire? I'm like, no, 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 there's tires. There are rubber tires on these wheels. And that is what the blade rides on. If for some reason you don't have your blade adjusted properly and the teeth of the blade are digging into the tires, you can tear apart that rubber and that can cause problems over time. I had that issue with mine and I had to replace the tires. It's not a fun project, but you do want to make sure your tires are in good working condition. And it takes a couple, it takes some interesting leverage to get the old one off and then to lever the new one on. I found using a couple large screwdrivers and prying it on in multiple sections seemed to do the trick, but I would not want to have to do that project again anytime soon. So make sure that your blade is adjusted properly and riding on the wheels properly. The interesting thing is it should ride right on the crown of the tire when it's rotating smoothly. Again, with the power off, you should be able to see that just by turning the wheel. And it is an interesting physics law. I'm sure there's a, there's, there are engineers out there that can explain this. The flat bandsaw blade will naturally center itself on a convex curve right at the top of that. It's pretty interesting. And so you can turn that by hand and you, that's also when you put a new blade in there, it's a good idea to turn that a few times to help get that riding up on top of that tire properly before you set the tension. And make sure the tension is set properly based on the instructions that come with your bandsaw. If for some reason you can't find your instructions, go to the manufacturer's website. Most manufacturers have PDF files of their instructions so you can download those there and read them thoroughly so you understand how to tension your blade properly. Usually there's a release lever in the back and then there's a spring that can be tightened up. In my case, I've got a wheel that can be tightened so that tension can be added to that blade. Now, you want just the right tension and it's a good idea to play with this a bit so that it's, again, matching what the manufacturer's saying and the instructions that it should be doing. There shouldn't be any vibration in your blade and it shouldn't wander around on the tire or on the wheel. So you wanna make sure you get your tensioning right. Again, follow the instructions that came with your bandsaw. I have three safety rules for the bandsaw. Number one, I have a five inch no-go zone all the way around that blade. That means no part of my body should ever go within five inches of that blade. So imagine a great big circle around that blade and if you 
feel that you're making a cut and your hand's gonna get close to that five inch circle, then reposition yourself so that your hand's not in that location. If you can't do this safely, then use a push stick. Use a piece of scrap material that can get cut by the blade instead of your hand, obviously. So that's number one. Make sure you establish and maintain a no-go zone. Secondly, don't go anywhere near the table of the bandsaw with the blade moving. This is a common one, and I'm willing to bet that the majority of accidents that occur happen with the saw off. When the saw is turned off, all of a sudden that motor goes quiet. The motor is usually loud, and the sound of it, it contacting the wood is also loud, so you have all this noise, but when the motor goes off, all of a sudden it seems as if everything gets quiet. And what's really happening is those flywheels and the, the way that the bandsaw is designed, it spins for a very long time. And you might forget that that blade is turning. So the second rule is we don't go anywhere near the bandsaw table or the blade until that blade is stopped. Now, this is the special feature that I have on my bandsaw that I highly recommend. And again, I'm going to put a link to a bandsaw almost identical to this, but the most current model of this in the description below. So check that out. And what makes this model unique is that it has a foot brake. So while I'm working a large log and turning it into a bowl blank, if I'm done cutting and I decide that's it, I want to stop, I don't move anything because I know that blade's moving. So what I do instead is I simply lift up my foot and apply it to the brake. Now, what's nice about this is not only is it braking and stopping that blade, it's also shutting off the motor for me. So there's a switch inside the cabinet that immediately turns off the power to the motor and it allows my foot pedal to manually apply pressure and stop that lower wheel. I can see that within a few seconds, I've stopped that blade. Now I can safely move around, take that wood away from the bandsaw table and bring it over to the lathe without the risk of bumping the blade and cutting myself. Now, rule number three is if you have to do anything with the bandsaw that requires going close to the blade, changing the blade, opening the cabinets, anything like that, the power is off and the bandsaw is unplugged. It's that simple. So. The rules again are establish and understand the no-go zone right in the center, five inches around that blade. Make sure that you're stopping the blade at all times before you continue doing anything around the saw. And if you have to do anything with the blade, make sure that the bandsaw is unplugged. Follow those three rules and you should be safe from any injuries. And also, make sure that you're reading all of the safety requirements from your manufacturer that are clearly spelled out in your instructions. Your machine might have some specific things that you need to know about. You might need to know where the kill switch is, things like that. So read your safety instructions. Your manufacturers don't want you to get hurt either, and they have specific instructions in the manual to keep you safe. There are some basic practices that you need to do when you're at the bandsaw. And quite honestly, these are somewhat of an extension of the safety elements you need to have when you're working with the bandsaw. One of the first things you need to think about as a best practice always, when you're approaching the bandsaw, you need to be distraction free. There needs to be zero distractions around you. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean other people, noises, clutter around you. You need to be able to move freely around you. If you're cutting a piece and you've moved your body and all of a sudden you're pushing up against something or you're tipping over something that's sitting in your way, that's a distraction and you're going to take your eye off what you're doing and that's not good. So you want to be distraction free. This goes further into obvious things such as we don't want to be drinking adult beverages prior to or while we're working with the bandsaw. That's a distraction. We also don't want to be tired. 
being tired can be just as bad or sometimes worse than adult beverages. So we wanna be focused. Even if you're thinking about other things, that's not good. If you can't be present at the bandsaw, then don't use the bandsaw at that moment. Go do something else. Come back when you are distraction free and alert because distractions are what really gets us in trouble. Another best practice that I see not practiced frequently, especially on YouTube, is the guide that is designed to keep your blade nice and straight needs to be lowered to your work height. In other words, if I'm cutting a blank that's this thick, I need to have the guide all the way down to this piece so that the only amount of blade that's exposed is this much blade. Now, why is that such a big deal? Well, two things. The guide wheels on your bandsaw are designed to keep that blade nice and straight. The closer you put them to your surface of your cutting material, the better job they're gonna do. There's less, less area for that blade to wander. Number two, if you leave your guide clear up at the top, like I see lots of people do, I don't know why they're doing this. Number one, you're probably not running through a 12 inch thick piece of material. Number two, that blade has all sorts of area to move around and wiggle and your cut's not gonna be so great and you might actually bind up your blade doing that. And number three, the worst part is you have all of that exposed blade right there to cause a really nasty accident. So bring that guide all the way down to your work height and keep it there. I, many times, if I have a log where I'm going to a tapered edge and it were coming up to a thicker spot, I'll lower it down to that low spot and I'll keep raising that guide as I'm cutting up to the highest spot so that it's just barely clearing the highest spot. And that's going to give you a great cut and it's gonna leave a lot less blade exposed. So use your guide properly so that it's supporting the blade and it's concealing the blade to help prevent accidents. Here's a simple best practice. Let your bandsaw come up to speed. There is a lot of momentum and a lot of energy that the motor creates with the flywheels. Essentially, that's what the wheels, the weighted wheels of this are essentially are flywheels. It takes a little while for those to get up to speed. And if you listen to your motor, you're gonna hear it start off slow and then get up to speed. Once it's up to speed, then you can start making a cut. You don't wanna just jam a piece of wood in there. The other thing you wanna keep in mind too is don't force the wood through this. You don't wanna push through too quickly and you don't want to try to drive a thick spot of, the, of a log through your blade very quickly. You'll find out if you do that, you will most likely stop the blade and it will get bound in there, especially if you're cutting wet green wood. The wet green wood, if you think about it, it's cutting those fibers and those fibers are wet and they're, they're immediately letting out all that moisture, but they're also changing shape. So they're kind of binding up against the blade. Whereas drier wood will essentially, that sawdust gets removed pretty quickly from the curve for the cut area of the blade. So it's not so bad, but you don't want to force it either way. If you're sensing the blade is really working hard, then change your pace, slow down a little bit and take your time, let it cut through the area and let the blade work at its own pace. Don't force it. So that's an obvious good practice, but I see a lot of people that don't do that where they force pieces through and then they cause problems to the blade and or bog down the machine. So there are many of the basic questions that I get about bandsaws hopefully answered for you. If you have any further questions, then leave those in a comment below. Also, while you're down there, click that like button. Thank you, I greatly appreciate when you do that. Be sure to check out my website, turnawoodbowl.com, where I have everything you need to know about turning wood bowls. Also, if you aren't already subscribing to this YouTube channel, then go ahead and click that subscribe button. For whatever reason, there is a large percentage of viewers that aren't subscribed. Hopefully you're not one of them, but by clicking that subscribe button, now you're no longer one of them. Thank you, I appreciate that. All right guys, thank you so much for watching and as always, until next time, happy turning.